With a history ranging over a decade long, the game Kenshi has a lot of interesting information behind it. So therefore, I thought it'd be pretty cool if I myself, Kuke Croc, put together 101 Kenshi facts all into one video. These facts are going to range from before the release of a game all the way into the game's release where I talk about gameplay facts as well as some Kenshi 2 facts near the end. If you enjoy this video, remember to leave a like or subscribe to my channel for Kenshi content. I'm sure some of you guys are going to know a lot of these facts, but I want to try to throw in as many wacky or unique facts as I can. With that out of the way, here are 101 Kenshi facts that every gamer should know. Number 1. Kenshi was made by one person named Chris Hunt. He began development of Kenshi starting around 2006 to 2008 and wouldn't discuss the game openly until 2011. He outsourced to a few other people for help for the game, but a majority of the groundwork was all done by him. Number 2. While Chris Hunt was developing Kenshi, he was working part-time as a security guard. He was able to leave a security job after around 5 years of working there due to the upcoming success of his passion project Kenshi. Number 3. Kenshi was originally funded mainly by Chris Hunt himself. Other than just putting his own money into the game, he was able to raise some additional funding through his website and different Kickstarter campaigns. Many of these showed off beta gameplay from Kenshi, and this would last until the game's release into Steam Early Access. Once the game was released on Steam, it made it much easier for Chris to hire freelancers and help for his game. Number 4. Kenshi is set in a post-apocalyptic world that is inspired by feudal Japan and other cultures. Chris Hunt early on would describe the game as a sword punk style, as the themes he was combining were fairly popular but just not mixed together often. Number 5. Kenshi in total took around 12 years to release. Starting early on in 2006, the game was on early access and available to the public starting 2013 and wouldn't finally release until near the end of 2018. 12 whole years and my characters still can't open gates or eat from my food barrels. Ain't that something. Number 6. Kenshi actually started development a long time before 2006. In fact, Chris Hunt even tweeted a about a couple very early prototype Kenshi screenshots. As you can see, the character has a gun, and uh, likely the themes in Kenshi were still being ironed out, but Chris Hunt was at work trying to figure out a project years before Kenshi was even in the works. Number 7. Kenshi was designed by Chris Hunt using an engine named Ogre. The engine itself was pretty good at the time, but as time passed, it quickly became outdated. Luckily, Kenshi 1 works and plays well enough, but if a game was made on a different engine, that'd probably mean there'd be a lot less clunks and loading pauses in between maps. Number 8. Kenshi would release in December of 2018 and would lead to it becoming one of the top 200 games of the Steam charts. Even to this day, 5 years after the game's release, it usually bounces around 3,000 and 10,000 peak players per day, making it one of the most popular and replayable single player games on the market. Number 9. Kenshi actually has no loading screens. Other than the initial loading screen that the player sees when they enter a new game or load a game, there are no loading screens in Kenshi. Sheet. Not when you go to a new biome, not when you go into a new building, there are no loading screens other than the breakups and pauses that happen because there are no loading screens. So I mean it works and it's cool, but at the same time, I, I don't know, I guess it- <laughs> Number 10. Kenshi has an open world that is over 870 square kilometers in size. For reference, Zelda Breath of the Wild has a map of 360 square kilometers, and Elder Scrolls Skyrim has a map size of 37.1 square kilometers. Number 11. The soundtrack the track for Kenshi was made by Cole Audio Solutions and includes 50 minutes of background music that is used throughout the game. It uses a lot of cellos, exotic winds, and other sounds to create the unique and impactful sound we have in the current game. It was released in May of 2016 and has 12 tracks in total. Number 12. One of the most popular Kenshi videos created is a video by Seth. This video brought in a huge wave of new players, and when asked in an AMA if Chris Hunt ever seen Seth's video, Chris would state that he did watch it and he even watched it twice. Number 13. Kenshi was inspired by types of media such as Kung Fu films, Seven Samurai, and Mad Max, along with Kenshi actually having some inspiration from Dark Souls. Chris Hunt has stated that he's a huge fan of how Dark Souls puts together 
together its world lore and story without any talking or cutscenes. Number 14, the inspiration behind the Kenshi character Beep started by Chris trying to make an easy to write NPC, which then expanded into more and more personality traits. Number 15, a majority of the dialogue in Kenshi was written by Chris Hunt's younger sister, Natalie. Stated in an AMA, Chris only wrote around 1% of the game's dialogue, and Natalie admit that Chris was behind the writing of Beep and she wasn't too sore about it, to which Chris added that he also did the writing for the Crab Tournament, but that didn't seem to take off, <laughs> at least not like Beep did. Number 16, in the game Files for Kenshi, the community was able to find a character model for a character named The Whistler. It's a pretty weird looking model, and it's only got like half a head. Chris Hunt stated in an AMA that The Whistler isn't canon and wasn't supposed to be in the game's files. He just didn't notice it. Likely a prototype or scrapped idea, The Whistler now lives on as a Kenshi mod, which just didn't make it into the final game. Number 17. Did you know that there are different trailers for the game Kenshi? Dating back all the way to 11 years ago when the first Kenshi trailer was made and put out. This featured very early alpha gameplay and looked much different different than the game we see today. Number 18. Other than Kenshi itself, Chris Hunt has openly stated he plays many other popular games that are similar to Kenshi. These games include Star Sector, Rimworld, Factorio, Space Engineers, and Imperion. Number 19. If a character in Kenshi endures a certain amount of damage, they can permanently lose their limbs such as arms or legs. It isn't that bad since you can buy prosthetic limbs which are often much better than standard limbs, but just don't try to do the same to the rest of your body. Unfortunately, there is no way to get a prosthetic head in Kenshi. Number 20. After a little under 2 years of Kenshi being available on Steam, Kenshi was able to sell over 1 million copies of a game as of October of 2020. Today in 2023, the total number is unclear of exactly how many copies of Kenshi have been sold. The number that we have is at least 1.2 million people have purchased the game through Steam. Number 21, according to the Steam charts, Kenshi has a total recorded playtime of 3.3 million hours between all of its Steam players. That adds up to 376 calendar years of just Kenshi being played. 376 years, that's a lot of Dust Bandit raids. Number 22. Despite the location's name in Kenshi, there are absolutely no skimmers inside of a skimmer's roam. This is an area in Kenshi and you can bring a skimmer there, but you will never find a skimmer just hanging out there or that will spawn there. And it's pretty ironic seeing as the skimmer is a very common monster you'll find pretty much almost everywhere else in Kenshi. Number 23. The lore of Kenshi actually goes back thousands of years before the game we play in today. There's the ancient time which had the first empire and then followed by the second Second Empire, both which separately lasted for around a thousand years each. Followed by a thousand years in between the fall of the Second Empire is where we start the game in Kenshi 1. Number 24. The First Empire in Kenshi was an advanced civilization that had automated factories and high-end technology. This included not only satellites, but also giant robots and godlike levels of technology compared to what's currently in Kenshi. This is likely where a lot of spacecraft-like fragments and robot pieces we see around the map come from. Number 25. At some point, a war broke out between the First Empire and an unknown enemy. The war was very destructive and used weapons so powerful that their owners began to fear the consequences of using them. The weapons they're referring to are called behemoths, which are giant skeletons that would tower over the normal races. This war between the First Empire and an unknown enemy would be called the War of the Behemoths. Number 26. Due to their fear of the behemoths, the ancients decided to dispose of them. Taking advantage of their unquestioning loyalty, the ancients ordered the behemoths down a massive pitch and then betrayed their servants by encasing the pit in a solid metal. Number 27. The Chaos Age was the end of Ancient's Kenshi timeline. It was a time of many calamities from dangerous celestial activity to natural disasters all the way to plagues and a skeleton rebellion. It's unclear exactly what happened during this time, but it brought the great empire of the ancients to its knees. This would then lead to humanity being at the brink of extinction. Number 28. The Second Empire is founded. Many hundreds or thousands of years after the Chaos Age, in order to redeem themselves and eyes of humanity for their actions of the past, even though the humans had forgotten, the skeletons never forgot. The skeletons felt bad for everything and wanted to redeem themselves and eyes of humanity for their actions, even though the humans had long since forgotten.
Catelyn, Catelyn and his skeleton followers funded an empire. They would attempt to rebuild civilization and study the remains of ancient empire. Number 29. You can find Catelyn in the Ashlands of Kenshi, where he commands an exile group from the Second Empire. When you meet him, he says, Has my judgment come so soon? I had to thrall them all. Traitors siding with humans. Treason. Now we are nothing. What was the point of it all? Have you tried looking after humans? They're monsters. As they grow in number, so does their capacity for evil, and they won't even notice as they do it. I was not the monster. He then screams and attacks you. One can only imagine what Catlon has been through since he saw humanity be rebuilt and then tear itself apart yet again. Number 30. At some point, and for reasons unknown, the humans of the Northwest developed a taste for human flesh. Catlon's empire spent a fair amount of resources combating them, including the formation of a militant group known as the Hydraulic Knights. These knights would combat the external enemies of empire such as pirates and cannibals. The cannibal tribes have legends that speak of a skeleton warrior that they know as the Inedible One. It is highly likely that this warrior was a member of a Hydraulic Knights and possibly their leader, General Jang. Number 31. While initially founded with good intentions to keep the peace, the empire became more and more dictatorial. The Empire of Kenshi would indulge in child prisons, crackdowns on piracy and religious cults, as well as the killing of many of their own innocent citizens. Tensions were very high with the public, and when a great famine hit, the Empire neared its breaking point. Number 32. While well, the details between the Holy Nation and the Empire are very sparse from the beginning and really not trustworthy, legends say around this time a great leader of humanity stepped forward and gathered his followers in rebellion. Legends call him Phoenix, champion of the god Okran, and the possessor of everlasting holy flame. He liberated the imprisoned humans and eventually went on to found one of the oldest living civilizations to this day, the Holy Nation. Number 33. It is unclear what actually caused the fall of the empire. The most reliable evidence would suggest betrayals from the inside, possibly combined with the rebellion of Okranites. Regardless, the empire would end up collapsing. Their leaders retreated into the dangerous Ashlands where they reside in Kenshi 1 to this day, and the rest of the empire would just fall into ruins. There are some settlements in the game, like Black Desert City, which survived, but many became towns that the United Cities would reside into. Number 34. Though it is unclear when or or how the Hivers appeared, it is evident that they were not around much, if at all, at the time of Catlon's empire, at least not in a form recognizable as a Hiver. Whether the Hivers mutated from humans or came from a land across the seas, they appeared and have been residents of Kenshi ever since. Number 35. While it is likely that the Shek existed during Catlon's empire, and possibly even back to the days of the ancients, they did not have the appearance they currently sport. Their previous appearance was much more similar to a standard human as they lacked the horns they are known for. It is unknown what role they played in the empires of old, though given the name it was possible that they were a soldier's caste dedicated to fighting their master's enemies. This could explain the Okranite belief of them being servants of darkness if they fought on opposite sides during the human rebellion against the second empire. Number 36. For as long as anyone can remember, the Sheks and Kenshi were just simple tribes living in the wilderness, divided and kind of chilling. At one point, a great Shek warrior named Krau unified the tribes into a powerful kingdom. Krau taught his followers a code of honor and strength and led them into a march of conquest. Eventually, however, he was slain in battle against an enemy force that legends say outnumbered him in a hundredfold. After his death, he attained near godlike levels of worship from his followers. All of them wanted nothing more than to die in a great battle like him. And so, the Sheks have continued their raiding and warlike ways with their neighbors ever since. This is why the Sheks don't really get along with a lot of people in the game and why they'll always try to raid you. Number 37. It is implied that the United Cities of a Traders Guild were formed of ashes of a former empire. Whether this was a second empire itself or another one is unknown, but the United Cities of a Traders Guild seized power and began to institute new laws regarding garden slavery. This would free people of a tyranny of a former empire and only criminals would be regulated forcefully to the mines and farms. However, much like the second empire in the past, the term of criminal was found to be more and more loosely applied. 
Number 38. As is Holy Nation tradition, the 62nd Phoenix was taken from his birth parents shortly after birth and raised in isolation by the high priest. There, he was indoctrinated into the Okranite religion and taught all the skills he needed in order to rule the empire. The 62nd Phoenix is insane. Essentially, he judged his own family at the age of 16 and sentenced them to death by being purged in the holy fire. Ever since then, Lord Phoenix has reigned champion and has the unrelenting will of Okrand at his hands. Number 39. A few decades ago, the Southern Plains in Kenchit suffered a drought. This in turn caused a severe famine which nearly brought the United Cities to its knees. Due to the situation, the Southern Cities were forced to rely on the Traders Guild to bring them the supplies they needed to survive. Unfortunately, bandits and Sheik raiders blockaded a majority of the trading routes and took these supplies for themselves. What little did get through was instantly set upon by nobles in a bidden war and the lower classes were driven to starvation and rebellion. The fighting claimed many lives including many nobles and even Emperor Anzai himself. But a majority of the rebels were eventually put down and survivors enslaved. Number 40. The rise of Emperor Tengu marked a selection of a new emperor from the noble circle. Tengu was a cruel and impulsive man known for his lack of common sense sense, and as a result, the poor and downtrodden are now even more heavily suppressed. Under Emperor Tengu's reign, he makes it so even you can be arrested and sold into slavery for merely being poor, as being poor is seen as a threat to the stability of the empire. Number 41. Bast was once a prosperous and fertile area, and it was filled with a lot of farmlands and towns for trading. However, everything changed when the Holy Nation attacked, who proceeded to burn towns and farms to the ground and hold the children off to to rebirth. It is unclear what exactly compelled this radical change that shattered the long peace, but it is likely that more or less it has to do with a tyranny of Tengu. It also possibly could be the paranoia of United City's elites having wild ambitions to take over grasslands or enslave the civilians. Either way, it has left the land as a war zone where both the United Cities and the Holy Nation fight in an endless battle. Number 42. Lu Quinn is a unique recruit imprisoned within Tengu's vault. He has a 30,000 cat's bounty and he has a brave personality. After he was imprisoned for murdering the noble Lord Kurosaga, as well as sending death threats to the other nobles, he was forced to write a beautiful Tengu a tribute about the Emperor book. Locked in Tengu's vault and forced to write a book about him, by the time the player finds Luke Quinn, he's been in the vault for 15 years, and if freed, he will join the player's faction. Number 43. Quinn and his family were sold into slavery at a very young age. They were subject to beatings, starvation and exhausting from working in the mines. Eventually, his father would succumb to horrid conditions, devastating both Le Quinn and his mother who, with nothing left to lose, devised an escape plan to save her son. She succeeded in freeing him, but it costed her her own life. Starving and alone in the desert at the age of 15, he was found and taken in by a clan of ninjas who trained him in the arts of stealth and assassination. Seven years later, he returned to his hometown for blood, using his skills to stalk and assassinate noble after noble. Eventually, Lu Quinn was arrested and paraded through the streets as a criminal before being sent off to Tengu's vault. This is where he would be subjected to many tortures, including being forced to write a book in tribute to Emperor Tengu. Number 44. Shagger at one time was the latest in line for king of a Shek kingdom. Like most Sheks, he saw battle as a point of honor, with death in battle being the highest of honors. Under his rule, the Shek kingdom was crumbling as they were constantly at war with the Holy Nation and the United Cities. Shagger proposed a desperate, kind of suicidal last stand, and this is when a warrior Bayan spoke up, protesting against throwing away their lives needlessly. Shagger was furious, but one of the Invincible Five, Asada of a Stone Golem, stepped between the two and shouted, the man speaks the truth. You want Bayan silenced? You'll have to cut me down first. Their swords crossed, and at that day, it marked the beginning of a new Stone Golem's rule. With Bayan at her side, she pulled her warriors off the front lines and made peace with the United Cities. This would then open the borders to trades from other races. Despite protests from some of her own warriors, she is determined to ensure her people survive into the future, even if it means tearing down some of their long-held ideals and traditions. Number 45. According to the theories that can be drawn from clues and texts in the world of Kenshi, humanity dates back farther than the modern age. Whether or not humanity predates skeletons is unclear, and this is one of the mysteries that complicates the history between skeletons and humans. 
humanity has been able to endure a number of natural disasters and conflicts that have plagued the world of Kenshi, but as books and many records have not been kept, most of the humans you meet in Kenshi are pretty unfamiliar with their own history. Number 46. The Hive, or also known as the Hivers, are a race of stick-like humanoids who are meant to collaborate under a collective mind ruled by a Hive Queen and her princes. Hive characters are separated into many different subspecies with their own unique appearance. The majority of Hivers care for little else other than just the Hive's happiness and survival and are willing to give their lives for the Hive as a whole. Number 47. The longer a Hiver is separated from the Hive, the more their bond with it is weakened. Once the bond breaks completely, the Hiver cannot return and is then considered Hiveless or Lost Ones as they are no longer connected to their Queen's pheromones. Number 48. There are three Hiver factions in Kenshi. First, there's the Western Hive, which is the friendliest Hive faction. They can be found in many zones of Kenshi, often in trade caravans. The Southern Hive is the second one, and they're a very violent faction. They usually can only be spotted in the southeastern quarter of a map, but depending on world states created by the player, they can invade new areas. And finally, the third one is when Hivers are separated from their Hive, they can become corrupt and turn into Fogmen. Fogmen are in insane, cannibalistic, and numerous. Number 49. Hivers have no sex or gender, and in character creation, they have their gender settings set to minus. But generally, Hivers are referred to as males by other members of races. Even the Hiver character Beep has dialogue suggesting that he does not at least consider himself female. But at the same time, he also has a minimal understanding of what a female is. Then again, it is 2023, so don't we all... Yeah, don't feel bad, Beep, but that's very woke. Number 50. Sheks are a race of bony, horned humanoids, and they are the only race which does not have a related sub-race. Sheks are just Sheks. Number 51. The Shek have a culture that values pride, honor, and physical strength, so much that many would prefer to die in a hopeless battle than continue living as a disgraced survivor. The Shek are known for their steadfast stoicism and considerable absence of humor when compared to the more jovial races such as the humans. Humans. However, they are much more enthusiastic when it comes to battling matters or surviving bleak situations. Number 52. Shek's bodies are covered from head to toe in bony plates which serve as an excellent natural armor. The Sheks are also remarkable for their long horns which are usually the source of pride for many Shek warriors. The Sheks are mainly known for their exceptional strength and incredible toughness. Number 53. Sheks are visually significantly larger than most of the other races and thus require much more food than any other race to survive. To be exact, humans have a hunger rate of 1 while the Sheks have a hunger rate of 1.25. This means for every 4 Sheks you have, they'll eat the same amount of food that 5 humans would. Number 54. The Skeletons are a complete mystery in Kenshi. Nobody really knows where they came from or how they were made. They are suspected to be thousands of years old old, fully sentient, and capable of feeling sadness, anger, excitement, compassion, thrill, and enjoyment. Even though they can feel emotions, they don't possess the ability to express anything visually. Number 55. The Skeletons in Kenshi heal two to three times faster than human Greenlander characters do. The Skeletons also bleed at a reduced rate compared to most organic races, and they also heal using repair kits or repair beds, opposed to med kits and normal beds. Number 56. In Kenshi, Kenshi, skeletons don't experience a lot of the effects that humans do in the world. Skeletons can survive in any zone because they're unaffected by weather and don't need to eat, thus eliminating the need for an environment that can support farming. Kenshi players often set their skeleton characters to work on turrets due to these same reasons. Number 57. In the lore, skeletons can be enthralled through a process that involves removing their heads. This appears to turn them into a mechanical zombie. Throws are essentially slaves and have no individuality. Number 58. Although extremely long-lived, the Skeletons have limited memory, which is the reason why they usually reset themselves every few centuries. Skeletons that don't do this are at a constant risk of losing their sanity. However, it is hinted by a Skeleton in the game that they remember the past and extinction perfectly, but act as a whole to prevent the knowledge of their involvement from being discovered. Number 59. It appears every Skeleton, aside from Throws, has the ability to drink Grog. Skeletons can't consume 
consume any other beverages or food in the game, but given the abundance of grog in several skeleton dominated areas, it can be assumed that they either drink it or maybe use it to oil their parts. Number 60. King is a unique crimper and the leader of a southern hive. He can be found wandering the royal valley alongside his drone guards, and if you're imprisoned by the southern hive, the king will appear and begin to eat the character. Number 61. If a player has kidnapped the queen of a hive, the king will join a base assault against the player. This base assault squad also contains a prince, a war gorilla, and eight drone guards, so if you don't want this big boy knocking at your gates, don't kidnap the queen of a hive. Number 62. Beak things, also known as gutters, are one of the most dangerous creatures in the world of Kenshi. Their nests can have anywhere from between 1 and 30 beak thing eggs, and these creatures are extremely fast. They hit hard, and they can eat their prey alive. There are outer beak things, which rarely spawn in certain locations, but they are much older and larger, which makes them even more strong and fast than the average beak thing. Number 63. The typical length of a beak thing's neck is approximately 2 meters, or 6 feet and 2 inches. That's taller than the average cool kid. <laughs> like, a beak thing could essentially fit a cool kid like me head to toe just in its neck. Number 64. In older versions, beak things could grow larger than mountains due to a misplaced decimal and had a crest-like membrane behind their heads. They could also speak, so if you think the beak things are bad enough as it is, be thankful Chris didn't leave that in the game. Giant speaking beak things sounds terrifying. It also sounds really cool, now I want them. <laughs> Number 65. Bone dogs are canine-like creatures in Kenshi which roam the wastes in large packs. They are fairly hostile when other inhabitants of a world roam into their territory, and while the bone dogs are wild by nature, they have been domesticated by people as trusty companions and loyal guardians. Number 66. Wild bone dogs are drawn to the scent of dead bodies and would devour anything that they find. They will not attempt to devour living characters even if they are playing dead, but if a bone dog finds a loose limb, Limb, it will play limb, where the bone dog will run around with a severed limb in its mouth until it's given a specific move order. Number 67. In Kenshi, the Leviathan is a humongous beast indigenous to the Leviathan coast of the northwest region of the map. They can crush an entire squad of men under their iron feet. They have up to 8,050 health points in her head and chest, with 4,025 health points in her arms and legs. Number 68. Leviathans are non-aggressive neutral beasts, which only attack in self-defense or to protect their mate and or young. Attacking a lone leviathan within the presence of a separate family unit will elicit no reaction from the family unit. This is also true for attacking a lone leviathan within the presence of another loner. Number 69. River raptors are bipedal reptilian creatures with round bodies and large jaws. The river raptors in Kenshi are omnivores and they attempt to eat crops growing in any farms that they come across as well as any corpses. They have nests and can mostly be found in areas of Okran's pride and wend. Number 70. A stronger version of a river raptors in Kenshi is called the swamp raptors and the swamp raptors can be found in the burning forest, the raptor island, the self wetlands, and the swamp. You can even find holy nation soldiers in the game who often call river raptors in order to protect the holy farms along the river. Number 71. The Cage Beast is a scrapped animal that is inside of the Kenshi game files. Using a mod, you can play with him in your game. Their original purpose would have likely been to hold cages on them and then put slaves in them for transportation, hence the name Cage Beast. There's no real confirmation on that, but it's one of my favorite monsters in Kenshi, even though it isn't in the actual game. Number 72. The Border Zone is a region between the Shek Kingdom and the Holy Nation territories. Aside from those territories, the Border Zone is is home to three minor factions. There's the Hub, which was a city previously under Holy Nation control but is now owned by the Holy Nation Outlaws. At the Hub and the nearby Rebel Base, trade ninjas can also be found and the majority of a border zone is terrorized by dust bandits and starving bandits. Number 73. Mongrel is a faction who resides in a town called Mongrel. There are a group of ninjas who have set up a base on one of the islands that give a Fog Islands biome its name. They have settled in the fog thanks to it providing a natural obstacle for their enemies in the form of the fog itself and the fogmen who live in it. 
number 74. In Kenshi, the Dust Bandits are a hostile faction that are found around the border zone. Dust Bandits are better trained and equipped than most of the other bandit groups such as Starving Bandits, and members of this faction will wear a distinctive uniform. This usually includes spiked helmets, heart protectors, armor rag skirts, and samurai boots. They often engage in extortion tactics, attempting to get their victims to pay tribute to them to prevent attacks from their raiding parties. Number 75. The Starving Bandits are a weak, hostile faction with very little organizational structure. They are found roaming mainly in and around the Holy Nation lands. This faction doesn't have any named characters, bases, or a faction leader. They don't even have any goals, I mean they're just made up from the hopeless and the penniless characters who've resorted to banditry to feed themselves. Whether it's blood or fortune, they will do whatever it takes to survive in the land of Kenshi. Number 76. The Shinobi Thieves act as fences and smugglers in the world of Kenshi. They're usually found in bars or residing inside thief watchtowers within various cities. You can pay 10,000 cats to join the organization by talking to a thief boss which is usually standing outside of one of their watchtowers. Number 77. The Anti-Slavers are a faction led by the legendary Tin Fist in a fight against the use of slavery. As a result, they gained many powerful enemies such as the Holy Nation and the United Cities who prey on the weak and exploited. The Anti-Slavers base is located atop a mountain in the southwest region of a map of Stobes Gamble. Number 78. Tin Fist is the infamous leader of the Anti-Slavers and resides at their city in spring. Tin Fist is a skeleton who possesses very high combat skills but focuses on using martial arts. Number 79. Skin Bandits are a faction of skeletons who steal the skin of humans in order to turn it into clothing. They will knock members of other factions unconscious and bring them to a peeler machine to which they would delimb and eventually kill the prisoner. You can talk to them as a skeleton and it is possible to join them. I mean, I wouldn't know if that's completely true. I would never have intentions of doing that. Peeling people apart, that's just weird, you know? Number 80. The Bugmaster is the leader of a spiders and a dangerous criminal who resides in the throne of a Bugmaster. He's surrounded by a giant army of skin spiders and blood spiders, and he has a 100,000 cat bounty and is considered the strongest bounty in Kenshi. So just remember that when you fight him for the first time. If you can't win, don't let it bug you. <laughs> Thank you. Like and subscribe. I'll be here all night. Number 81. Kenshi didn't hit its peak player count until five years after its original release. I made an in-depth video talking about this, so a uh, free plug right there. The reason why Kenshi didn't hit its peak player count until five years after was mainly because of a surge of content creators covering the game, as well as the hype of Kenshi 2 placed alongside Kenshi going on sale. Number 82. One of Kenshi's biggest content creators is a YouTuber that goes by Juju Land. He is a Spanish YouTuber and started playing the game which opened it up to hundreds of thousands of non-English speaking viewers. Number 83. Kenji 2 was announced to be in development on March 20th, 2019, where Chris Hunt put out a forum post on the Lo-Fi Games website. He stated in this post that the game would take place 1,000 years prior to Kenji and would expand on the game's existing world and lore. He originally didn't want to share this information, but seeing as so many people were worried about Kenji being an abandoned project, he needed to announce it. Number 84. Kenji 2 will be developed using the Unreal Engine. Making the switch early on in development, the Lo-Fi Game Studio switched from the Ogre Engine due to the Unreal Engine being a lot more up to date and realistically should make Kenshi 2 much easier to program and update for everyone. Number 85. Kenshi 2 currently has a team of 28 people working on it across the world. Compared to Kenshi 1, which had Chris Hunt for a majority of the time with some help from a few others, the workforce has more than quadrupled thanks to the success of Kenshi 1. Number 86. The character model for the Kenshi 2 Hiver has been officially shown, and while subject to change, the second game will include the characters from the first game with much more realistic looks and models. Number 87. Kenshi 2 will have a district dividing feature, so towns will be able to have different groups or classes of people in them. Number 88. Shopkeepers in Kenshi will greet you by saying, oh, hello, a new customer, or something along those lines, but then in future visits, they'll change their dialogue to something like, my favorite customer returns, welcome friend. Number 89. The gates in Kenshi 2 will be very different from the first game, with the walls in the second game plan to have garrisons and towers, you can build onto them and optimize. This will make militaristic defense much more realistic in your cities or outposts in Kenshi 2. Number 90. 
As of now, Kenshi 2 is in a localization phase of development. This means it's being translated and ported to other languages. While lots of information on the game has yet to be shared, it's safe to assume that with the game starting to be translated and localized for other countries, that means a lot of the groundwork for the game is hopefully finished. Number 91. Kenshi 2 will expand on the lore of the Hivers a lot with more realistic complexions and supposedly more things to learn about them in the second game. We didn't get a whole lot of quests or scenarios involving different Hivers in Kenshi compared to the other races, but the Hivers still stand out to a lot of people as their favorite race in Kenshi. Number 92. On April 1st of 2023, Lo-Fi Games released a free Kenshi game through itch.io titled The Hive Queen's First Date. This is a text-based adventure dating simulation game, and although it is an April Fool's joke, it is a real game that you can download and play through. This also technically counts for the true second game in the Kenshi franchise, so I mean I guess we don't need Kenshi 2 anymore. I'm looking forward to Kenshi 3 though. Number 93. From April to May of 2022, Lo-Fi Games hosted a Kenshi speed run in which players competed to see who could collect and sell three different eggs in Kenshi the fastest. The top 10 players were awarded a signed Kenshi t-shirt and were immortalized on leaderboards. Number 94. Combat is a big part of Kenshi and all combat except for martial arts is done with weapons. Weapons are split into multiple different categories, each dealing different types of of damage and amounts of damage. Armor is designed to reduce damage and types of damage and can be slightly penetrated by using certain different weapons. Number 95. There are six weapon groups in Kenshi. Blunt weapons primarily deal stun damage. Hackers are weapons which balance cutting and stun damage along with dealing additional damage against robots. Heavy weapons take longer to swing but deal large amounts of damage in a wide arc. Katanas are weapons which specialize in speed and cut in damage. Pole arms are long weapons that can be swung very quickly and they usually deal additional damage against animals. And lastly, sabers are weapons which deal both types of damage, primarily cutting damage, but they can be really heavy as well. Number 96. Depending on who smiths the weapon in Kenshi, each weapon has a different rank or quality, starting at rusted junk going all the way up to refitted and then katum, then up to MK and edge type, and then finally Maito, which is the best quality of weapon in the game. Number 97. A food cube is a food item purchased from different traders or created in a cooking stove in Kenshi. They're pretty good for traveling rations and can be really profitable to mass produce and sell. Food cubes are essentially just a nutritious block that's made from a vegetable grain mixture. It's similar in concept and appearance to the real world's neutral loaf. Number 98. A dust witch is an item that can be purchased from different traders or created in a cooking stove in Kenshi. The dust witch is obviously Kenshi's parallel to the real world's sandwich. It has green cactus paste kept between two slices of bread. Number 99. There are a lot of different skills to level up in Kenshi. These skills are separated into different groups which include attributes, weapon skills such as melee and range, separate combat skills, thievery skills, athletic skills, science skills, and trade skills, adding up to a total of 33 skills that you can train up and level up in the world of Kenshi. Number 100. The max level you can reach with most skills in Kenshi is level 100. Certain skills such as strength will show a visible difference on your characters as you level up. The higher the level goes, the better your character's appearance will get, while other skills like dodge or martial arts will unlock new animations and better moves as you level up. Number 101. Acid rain is a form of weather that occurs in polluted zones in Kenshi. You can get clothing that protects you from acid rain and characters will build tents in order to hide from it. Entering any building will also protect characters from acid rain, but skeletons, hivers, and all types of animals don't have to worry as the acid rain doesn't damage them. Wow! We did it guys, 101 Kenshi facts. This was a lot of work to put together. I'm going to attempt to link, you know, most of the sources of the description as well. A lot of information was just gathered from the Lo-Fi Games website as well as the Kenshi wiki, but there's a lot of Reddit posts and different things that I found interesting. If you'd like to see a 202 Kenshi facts video where I talk about another 101 facts, then let's try to get this video up to like a thousand likes. If it hits that, then I'll get on making another one right away. But yeah. 
yeah, this video took a long time to make, so hopefully it does well and you guys enjoy it. I was really surprised on how much I was able to cover while still seeming like I could probably cover another 101 facts. Honestly, there's so much to talk about when it comes to Kenshi, and it was hard to not just focus on one main topic. Of course, if you'd like to hear me talk about Kenshi more, subscribe to my channel and leave a like. Let me know how many of the facts on the list you did know before going into the video, and how many of them was it your first time hearing. Whether or not everything was new, or you only got a handful of cool new facts to take away, let me know in the comment section your favorite fact about Kenshi. Anyways, as always, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.